Greetings to all of you, and welcome to this next session on the book of Revelation. This is session number 26. I'm Pastor Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today as we spend time navigating through this wonderful and uh, questionable book. Uh, so I uh, thank you for coming out. If this is the first opportunity you've had to be part of our sessions, I certainly would invite you to check out some of our previous sessions particularly the first session that refers to and talks about the basis of apocalyptic literature as well as the symbolism and the knowledge and, and the background and the numerology and all that kind of stuff. So I certainly would encourage you to check those out if you haven't had the opportunity. There's plenty of information that has led up to this point. We have been walking through the book of Revelation from the beginning up to this point now as a way to interpret and understand not only what the writer is saying, not only what the revelation to John at Patmos uh, is saying at the time, but also how we can apply it to ourselves today. Also how we can apply it to where we are in our faith journey, as particularly in the midst of this time of pandemic. Uh, now we are seeing that uh, we're resurging in our numbers. Things are starting to shut down again. Things are starting to close back in as we move into the winter months. Uh, and so, you know, it does certainly continue to bring the question, is this the end time? Is this the end? Why I started this study on Revelation was because that question was brought before me and it was referred to from Revelation. So I figured it would be good for us to be able to walk through this book and get an idea of what is being brought out, why it's being brought out and how we can apply it to our lives today. So I'm thankful that you're part of this discussion, as part of this, this journey with us. Uh, it is a pleasure to be able to offer it, and I hope that for you it is beneficial and growing, and I hope that you have the opportunity to uh, go deeper into this fascinating and wonderful book. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It's the last book in the New Testament, so I would encourage you to have a Bible in front of you, either paper or on screen. You can use whatever translation or paraphrase that you wish. I'm working with the new Revised Standard Version, which is the version that is used not only in the Revised Common Lectionary that we use on Sunday morning at the church, but it's also the Bible that I use for my own study and growth, um, as I feel it is the most accurate to the ancient literature, the ancient language, and the, the most accurate translation. But you can use whatever you have in front of you. Um, different translations and paraphrases, they certainly help to bring out a different vision, a different view. Uh, the Bible is a very fluid living document. Uh, it applies to our lives, even though the words are the same, the words speak differently based on where we are. So when we come to read the Bible, uh, the Bible may have the same words as it did last week, but we're in a different place. And that's what makes it a living document, is that it speaks to where we are in the moment, uh, regardless of what our moment is, whether we are on the, the heights of joy or the depths of sorrow. Um, that's where, that's where the Bible brings, because that's where God is. Uh, we have a God who is with us no matter what. I hold on to the words of, of David in the Psalms, uh, where David says that, you know, if I take the, ings, the wings of eagles and fly to the highest mountain, you are there. Uh, or if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, in the depths of the dead, you are there. There is no place I can go where you are not. So we have a God who is with us in all things. And the word is with us in all things, and it speaks to us in all things. And that's why this is such a powerful living document, because no matter where we are, the word goes with us and has something to say to us. Okay, so we're in chapter 13 of Revelation now, and we're in this section. John has led us to the point now where he's really focusing in on the historical context and, 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 and growing out of that. Um, the Roman... Uh, the Roman Empire and what the Romans are doing to the Christians and how the Romans are ruling. So we've seen, uh, you know, the, 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 the dragon, the devil, Satan, now backing the Roman Empire. That's what we got at the beginning of 13, whereas the, the, the devil, John sees the Roman Empire as the, the earthly arm of the devil. Um, and how the devil is working through the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire is standing against the Christians, standing against the work of God. So anything that stands against the work of God, either actively or passively, would be the work of the devil. You're either working for God or you're not. If you're working for God, then you're leaning into God. If you're not, whether you're actively against God or passively against God, you're still against God. There's no middle ground. And I think that's something that uh, I'll just kind of tangent here from, and I've talked about this a number of times, 
is that in our American spirituality, in our modern spirituality, there's really three categories. You're with God, you're against God, and then you're in the middle. Or you're kind of with God, kind of not with God. God's good, God's important, but God's not, you know, Jesus is Savior, but not Lord. Well, in John, in the scriptures, that third category is not there. You're either with God or you're not. And if you're not with God, you can be actively against God or you can be passively against God. Where God really doesn't matter, but God's really not, God's important, but not taking center stage. Okay? Not choosing to be against God, but not really living into the full totality of what God is expecting or requesting. So what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation, we're seeing John identify the Roman Empire as the agent of the devil working against God, persecuting the Christians, trying to stifle the word, trying to stifle the work of the kingdom in the world. And that's where we get in chapter 13, and we're going to continue on with that. So we saw the beast coming up out of the, out of the, out of the sea. That would be the Roman Empire, the dragon standing behind the beast, uh, using the beast as the, as the dragon's arm, the devil's arm of persecution, trying to eradicate the Christians. Because the devil tried to destroy the Messiah, it didn't work out, so the devil went after the Christians and is using the Roman Empire to do that. That is what John is seeing. So here we are now, chapter 13, verse 11. And we're going to continue on this understanding. So John says, Then I saw another beast that rose up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised authority of the first beast on its behalf. And it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose, whose mortal wound had been healed. Okay, so there's just beasts all over the place coming up here. So the second beast is not taking over the first beast. So the first beast um, in, in, for John would be the Roman emperor would be the seat of Roman power. So that is where the devil is standing behind. The devil is standing behind the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor believed, proclaimed, as the son of God. The Roman emperor, it was required that all inhabitants bow down to the Roman emperor. So in Rome, every city, there would be a statue of the Roman emperor. And it was required of every, uh, of every inhabitant, of every citizen, to bow down to the Roman Emperor, to the statue, because it was believed that the statue was the living representation, almost as if the statue, every statue, and this is what was taught, this is what was brought forward, was that every statue had the eyes of the Roman Emperor. So if you walked by the statue of the Roman Emperor and you were in uh, Thessalonica, hundreds of miles from Rome, or where the, where the seat of Roman power was, it was believed that the Roman Emperor could see you walk by without bowing down. It was believed that the Roman emperor had eyes everywhere. And the Roman emperor really did have eyes everywhere. And that's the nature of the second beast. Now, the Roman emperor wasn't living in every one of the statues, of course. They were statues of stone. But the second beast that stood up and held up the first beast, these would be the temple cult. These would be the priests, the religious leaders in Rome. These would be the governors. These would be the, the satraps. All of the people who were employed by the Roman emperor to keep peace in Rome. Remember we said, when we talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse way back in, in, in the early chapters of Revelation, that one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, one of the things that Rome feared, and, and it's kind of funny, it's kind of ironic, because if you think about where we are in modern times today, one of the things that Rome feared was internal strife. They feared an uprising from within. Now, not to sound too conspiratorial, but we have seen that our institution does monitor its citizens. And one of the reasons is for the fear of internal strife. Every structure that has power feels threatened if there's another structure that can take that power down. So Rome was terribly afraid of risings from within. And understand, I mean, Rome stretched out over many countries. The Roman politic was when they went in, and we see this in, in the Bible, when they went in and, and, and took over a country, they left the rulers in place. That's why Herod in the Gospels actually is still the king of the Jews and still has power over the Jews because Rome knew 
that if they took out the leaders, the people would rebel. That's how they kept peace. Of course, the people were deathly afraid that Rome was going to come in and wipe them out, but they allowed the local leaders to stay, understanding that the local leaders would answer to Rome. So this second beast rising up out of, the, out of the land, and the second beast, it had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So I'm going to go back to Talbert again, uh, just briefly for the understanding of the two horns and the, the speaks like a dragon. So it's rising up out of the earth. It had two horns, great, then two horns represent great strength, and speaks like a dragon. Its ultimate authority is the dragon. Okay, so this second beast speaks the authority of the dragon, speaks the authority of the, of the devil, and it has ultimate authority. So no one questioned it. I mean, think back to this. Pilate, who it was clear in the scriptures, didn't want to kill Jesus. Pilate did everything he could to release Jesus. Not because he had a soft spot for Jesus. Not because he... Um, not because he, you know, he believed Jesus to be the Son of God. He really didn't care one way or another. But he didn't want to crucify this man because then it would give the image that Rome was just killing innocent people. Nothing causes rebellion quicker than when the ruling government starts to execute innocent people. There's a line. All humans have a line. And there's a point where you cross that line, where you're pushed over that edge. Even in Rome, there were boundaries in Rome. And Pilate didn't want to cross those boundaries. Now, was Pilate questioned? No. Pilate did what Pilate did. The Roman emperor is not going to care. Pilate had authority. The only time that Pilate would have had his authority taken away is if he challenged Rome. And he didn't. Rome didn't care about the Israelites. The emperor didn't care about the Israelites. The emperor cared about the emperor. So what we see here is that second beast that rise up, they have ultimate authority, ultimate power. What they say in the province goes, and they speak for the dragon. So not only is the Roman emperor the first beast, but the second beast are all of those who serve the emperor to keep people oppressed. So John would go back and say that Pilate was working for the devil. That Pilate was an arm of Satan when he executed Jesus, when he gave the order for crucifixion. So that's what they do. You know, this second beast who are all of these in authority, um, priests and governors and officials and low-level officials, all of these tentacles. So the Roman emperor has eyes everywhere. Which means the dragon has eyes everywhere. If you were a Christian in Rome, and the local authority, the governor or the council, they caught you for being a Christian, and, and they, they put you up for execution, there was nobody you could go to. You couldn't plead your case. You, you weren't going to get to the emperor. The emperor didn't care. It was like, look, if they say it is, it is. That's how it worked. The only time the emperor cared is if someone challenged the emperor. So the beast, the second beast that rises up, these are, um, these are, are, are all of the officials, all of the people scattered about Rome who keep the peace. And they answer, they answer to the first beast. So it exercises all authority over the, uh, of the first beast on its behalf and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound had been healed. So again, that points back again. Remember about Nero. We talked about Emperor Nero last time. So we're not really clear which Roman emperor that John is, is, is having this revelation to. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about the personality. It matters about the seat of power. The seat of power is the seat of power regardless of who sits in it. Okay, let's look at our own, um, let's look at our own, our own understanding. The White House is the White House. The presidency is the presidency. And there have been 45 presidents so far. And now every one of those presidents has been different, but it's still the presidency. So you have the office, and then you have the person in the office. Well, the Roman Empire was the same way. You had the emperor, 
You had the seat of power, and then you had different people serving in that seat of power. So what John is saying here is that not necessarily the beast is standing behind one particular person, though the myth of Nero really helps to, dra to drill it down, but the dragon, the devil, is standing behind the seat of power in Rome, which is the emperor, and then all of those who answer the second beast, they answer to the seat of power. It doesn't matter who that seat of power is. Okay? And they force the people to worship the first beast. They don't, they, they're not requiring worship in themselves. They're pointing to the worship of the first beast. So again, if you were in Thessalonica and you didn't bow down to the statue of the emperor and the, and the governor or one of his underlings or whoever caught you, and you were drugged before the governor, you weren't executed because you didn't bow down to the governor. You were executed because you didn't bow down to the emperor. The governor's power came from the emperor. And so the governor's job, or whoever it was, the temple priests, the cult leaders, whatever, it was their job to enforce this power, to enforce this arm, this, 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 this beast. So, okay, so verse 13, it performed great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to the earth in, a sight, in the sight of all. And by the signs, by this, by the signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it, was all, all, and, it, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay. So, um, <laughs> magic and theatrics. So, so this went as far so emperor, the emperor's desire for control went as far as employing magic and sleight of hand. Um, now, you know, keep, keep in mind that gunpowder was, um, was, was, was discovered by the Chinese back 3,000 years before Christ. So the ability, the alchemy to make fire rain down from heaven, which... You know, this is that, that vision, if we go back to the Old Testament with Elijah and the prophets of Baal, okay? So the emperor is capable of doing what, what the Israelite God did in the Old Testament, making fire rain down from heaven. Is it to the same degree? No. And, and who knows? I mean, who knows what we could be looking at here? Who knows what this could be? This could be an archer on a far rampart shooting a flaming arrow over into the city. This could be knowing when a thunderstorm rolls up. There's any possible way. Again, and 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 how do you make the how do you make the beast the 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 image speak? Well, that's pretty easy actually. You get some dude back there hiding behind a curtain with a megaphone or some kind of device that amplifies voice. Okay? Again, and, and <laughs> you know, people didn't people didn't have the knowledge that we have today. They didn't have the experience we had today. So you're walking along, la, 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 you're strolling through Thessalonica, you got your pomegranate and your dark bread and you're ready to go home and you don't stop and bow down to the beast and, and the guy behind the curtain sees you do it and breaks out the, the, the little um, you know, audio device, whatever it is, and says, stop, you did not bow down to me. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, you're terrified of the Romans anyway. So if you don't stop and bow down, then you get drug off. And, um, you know, performing these signs, performing these things, these little magic tricks to make it believe that the Roman emperor is there. Keep in mind, I know from our perspective, it's very hard to, to figure how people could be easily fooled. But, this stuff wasn't just readily available. They didn't have the entertainment caliber that we do. Most of them couldn't even read. They lived in a very superstitious world. Rome flourished under superstition. 
It flourished under the creation of all of these different gods. You know, look, I mean, we have the mantelpiece here in, in Rome. You know, their mantelpiece would have had all these different gods up there. And, and so, you know, like the little statue of, of Dionysus, or the little statue of, 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 of Zeus or whoever. I'm, I'm mixing my, my pantheon here. Sorry about that. Uh, they're watching you. These statues are alive. They're watching you. That's what the people believed. And they believed that this great big statue in the, in the town square was watching everybody. Now, of course, we know better. But we've also advanced in a great deal of knowledge in a lot of areas. Maybe too much, but that's for another conversation. Their superstition ran high. And the people knew it. Look, you don't create and maintain power over a massive amount of population that the Roman emperor did without having a few tricks up your sleeve. And theatrics was one of those tricks. The theatric of making a statue talk. Well, we see it all the time. Jeff Dunham does it all the time. I like Jeff Dunham. He's fun to watch. Me a little, uh, you know, but he's fun to watch. So... This is what we need to see. This statue isn't coming to life. But the people are being deceived into thinking that it is. And why? Because the emperor does not want to have his power challenged. And if he's in Rome and you're in Thessalonica, how is the emperor going to control you? By making you think that he's right there watching you. And how does that happen? By all of the underlings, all of the people who have been given power, create this aura. Look, if you don't bow down to the emperor, we're going to kill you. And that only happens three or four times before people get it. Look, I may not believe that this guy is the son of God, but I don't want to lose my head or get thrown into the lion, so I'm going to bow down to him. The Christians didn't. For a Christian, bowing down to the Roman emperor, for a Christian, bowing down to the Roman emperor would have been denying Christ. Christ you know, the early church in Paul, Paul talks about, you know, living peacefully as best we can. Not being rebellious, not bucking the system. However, there's a point. If you can live in peace with each other, live in peace with each other. But if living in peace with each other means you need to bow down to another God and deny your Savior, that's where the line has been drawn. Martin Luther, some 1,500 years later, um, in his, in his uh, essay on secular authority. He said that we as Christians are called to, 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 to um, follow secular authority. I was going to say bow down, but we're called to follow secular authority. When the law of the land is laid out, we're called to follow the law of the land until the law of the land breaks the law of God. Once the law of the land breaks the law of God, then we follow the law of God and we accept the punishment of the law of the land. So for a Christian in early Rome, as they walk by the big statue, and the big statue says, hey, you didn't bow down to God. Now the Christian doesn't have to shoot back and say, you're not God, but the Christian can keep, keep going. And if the Christian is arrested, why didn't you bow down to Caesar, emperor, son of God? The Christian says, well, that is not my God. My God is Jesus. And if that means that the Christian is put to death for it, then they die for their proclamation. That's what martyrs did and have done throughout the centuries and still do today. Literally, still do today. There are Christians around the world who are executed for their faith. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing the second beast. So all of the people who are servants to Rome, all of the people who serve the emperor, John calls an extension of the devil. They are the second beast. They speak the words of the devil. So every time, so when Pilate executed Jesus, Pilate wasn't speaking his own words. He was speaking the words of the devil. He was doing the work of the devil. Just like a Christian, when we speak words of hope, we're not speaking our own words. We're speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. We're speaking the words of God. So you see the dichotomy that's being laid up here. Rome... And everything about Rome is the antithesis of a Christian. 
Rome and everything about Rome is the antithesis of a Christian because Rome is the earthly arm of the devil. And that could be extrapolated out. You know, any government, any structure, and, and, and I think, you know, when we look at, um, when we look at the Reformation, uh, we can even see this in the institutionalized church. Any structure that requires you to bow down to it over your God is acting in the same way. Jesus talks about it. He says, look, I didn't come to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring sword. I came to set father against son, mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. And the point is this. Not that Jesus wants family strife, but following Jesus is going to create family strife. And if you have to choose between following Jesus and holding on to family tradition, the course of the believer is to follow Jesus, even if that breaks family tradition. That's what this means. That's the power of this Jesus. This Jesus is so important that there is nothing that should come above it, including life itself. So in Rome, Christians were the ones who the Roman emperor was trying to destroy because Christians represented the greatest internal threat because they would die rather than give up this son of God, this Jesus. All right. Um, so this beast, by the signs that it was allowed to perform on the behalf of the beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth, telling them, to make an image of the beast that had been wounded. That's where the statue comes up. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Again, so we can see where this is going. We can see John is actually right now peering into the actual life of the Christians in Rome and how Rome is set up. He is just calling them beasts. He's not calling them Rome because, look, as we look out through history, as we look out through history, it is not hard to circumvent Rome from this and implant it on other governmental regimes, other throughout history, be it the Germans or the English or the Americans or the, you know, or the Saudi Arabians or the Russians. Any institution, any any system that stands against God can fall under this. Maybe the details are a little bit different. But you know what? I mean, now in our world, if we would look at anything that stands against God as the beast and, and the beast being given the ability to speak, well, anybody can speak now. So part of the reason why John doesn't write a historical piece about the Romans is because as this book transcends a specific history, a specific time in history, we can see how other institutions, other regimes can be placed into this very thing. And again, what was the ultimate threat? The ultimate threat was if you don't bow down to the beast, you're going to die. What's the ultimate response of the Christian? Kill me because I'm, I would rather die proclaiming Christ than live proclaiming anybody else. That's where the Christian became a problem for the Romans because anybody else, any other belief structure, wouldn't hold on to their belief structure to the point of death. We as humans want to live. The will to live, the drive to live supersedes everything else. And the more trauma we get, the more face we move back here into the back of our brain that has that animalistic lizard point, I need to live regardless. But for a Christian... If we are forced to choose between our life and our proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then as Christians we hold on to the proclamation even at the expense of our life. And here's why, here's why. If we deny Christ to save our skin, then we are saying to God that our life is more important than you. Jesus talks about the unforgivable sin in the Gospels, and that's being a sin against the Holy Spirit. That being that you know Christ is Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit has re re revealed that to you, and yet you deny it. That's the unforgivable sin. Um, and so, wherever you're at in life, 
If you're forced to choose between your Savior and your life, if you choose your life, then whatever the rest of the days you have, but you've just sacrificed an eternity. You've just sacrificed an eternity. So Rome didn't like the Christians because every other people bowed down to the Roman emperor because they didn't want to die. The Christians died because they didn't want to bow down to anybody but Jesus. And that was a problem. Because if you don't have the threat of taking someone's life, what do you have? Nothing. If someone is not afraid to die for it, then you have no power over them. That's why Rome had a problem with the Christians. So it gave the power of the beast, the second beast, to create this image, make it speak, so that those who would not worship the image of the beast, those who would not bow down to the image of the Roman emperor, were killed. There was no question. You were drug out and killed. They didn't care whether you believed it. You just had to bow down and worship it. You could curse them under your breath all you want, but you need to be seen bow down and worship it. All right. Also, this is verse 16 now, also, it caused all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one could buy or sell who doesn't have the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of the name. All right, so um, a couple of things to make clear. This was not uncommon. Religious markings, religious tattooing, this was not uncommon. I mean, we as Christians today, I mean, even, even now today, I mean, I wear a mark of my God. I actually have a tattoo on my shoulder with a Christian symbol. So marking was a sign of ownership. Now, we as Christians, what do we hear um, in baptism? Child of God, you have been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. So we get that mark on our forehead. So we have the mark of the Savior on our forehead. Now, is it visible? No. Is it visible to God? Yes. Now, Part of this, remember going back to the Great Tribulation, that um, those who were sealed by God, those who were sealed by God were, um, were, were protected through the Tribulation. So this is the anti, this is the antithesis of it. But another part, another part is, Rome was such a huge international conglomerate. Citizens of Rome got different treatment than non-citizens. Okay? Citizens of Rome got different treatment than non-citizens. We see that with Paul. Paul was arrested for something that a citizen is allowed to do, but a non-citizen is not. And Paul, to the jailer, said, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this. And they immediately released him. So being a citizen of Rome, being a citizen of Rome had its benefits, but you needed to prove your citizenship. And how did you do that? By having a mark of the Roman Empire on your body, either on your forehead or your arm, your right hand. So basically, and who knows what the mark was? It's pretty unclear. Uh, we'll, get to the, we'll, we'll get to what we get to in a minute. But it's pretty unclear what the mark was. But it needed to be clear that you were a citizen of Rome. So you had a mark of some kind. It was usually pretty much here. We see it still today. The Coptic Christians have little crosses right here. So it can be covered if necessary, but it's clear. So all I have to do is extend their arm out. You see the little cross. You know they're a Coptic Christian. Um, so there was a mark. A Roman citizen had a mark of citizenship. And if you went to the market and you went to buy something, you had to prove that you were a citizen. If you didn't prove that you were a citizen, the vendor may choose not to sell it to you or sell it to you at a different price. So a loaf of bread was 50 cents for a Roman citizen and five bucks for a non-citizen. Again, and there was no Department of Commerce. The emperor didn't care. You don't like it, get out. That, that was Rome. You don't like being a non-citizen, either become a citizen or get out. Pay the price. So, but getting the mark meant that you were bowing down to the emperor. And if you didn't have the mark, then you come under suspicion. Why don't you have a mark? Who are you? So if I'm a bread seller, 
okay? I'm a bread seller and someone comes up to my booth to buy bread. They say, I want that, that loaf of Asiago cheese bread there. Um, and I say, okay, show me your mark. Well, have a mark, okay? So that loaf of bread is five bucks, but it says 50 cents, but you gotta have a mark, you gotta be a citizen. But not only am I having this interaction, now there's someone else paying attention. And if I get the eye of that person, then they start to pay attention to the person buying the bread, which means that they come under the radar of Rome. And if they're under the radar of Rome, then their life becomes into question. Why don't they have a mark? They're a non-citizen. Why are they a non-citizen? Who are they? Are they a Christian? So to be marked by the beast, and that's the mark, the mark of Rome. So when we talk about the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, the beast is Rome. The mark of the beast is Rome. The mark of Rome. Many, many, um, many uh, civilizations, even religious organizations throughout time have required marking of some form to prove. That is the next step. Abraham, God used circumcision as the mark of faithfulness in Israel. God used circumcision. So even God had a physical mark to prove that you were part of the group. Um, so every, every great civilization in some form or another had a mark. We, in our modern times, we don't have a mark. There's no mark of citizenship. But, I mean, in some ways, it's not marked on the body, but there's a lot of things. If you don't have an identification card, then there are things that you're excluded from as an American citizen. Um, if you want full rights of, of what's going on, then you need to be a citizen. That's the, uh, and, and that's the, the thought process. You need to have identification. And you can't just say you have identification. You need to have identification. All right, so you get it. So that's the mark. The mark of the beast is the sign of Rome that you're a citizen. Whether it's on the forehead, some kind of dot or, or small indicator. I mean, they didn't put like a big baseball on people's foreheads. Uh, some kind of dot or indicator uh, that, they, again, and if, if you wore some kind of headdress, all you need to do is pick your headdress up a little bit, and there was that mark. It didn't have to be anything big, uh, deforming. But the body was marked, either on the, ha on the hand or the head so that one could buy and sell, so that one could interact as a citizen of the country of Rome. But with that mark meant that you were bowing down to the Roman authority. You couldn't get that mark without bowing down to Roman authority. Okay? You couldn't say, I'll get the mark, I'm going to bow down to Roman authority. Even if you're bowing down to Roman authority, saying, I'm going to get the mark, but in my heart, I still believe in Jesus. No, that's not how it works. Heart and mouth. What you believe comes out of the mouth. What you believe in your heart comes out in your actions. You can't believe one thing and do another. Your actions and your belief need to coincide, even if that means you give up your life for your beliefs. That's how it works. That's what we're dealing with here. All right. So then there's the name of the beast or the number of the name. So there are two different kind of marks. This calls for wisdom. This is verse 18 now. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone who, who, with understanding, calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. So, it's the number of a person. It's the number of the Roman emperor. So, what, what John is doing here is John is demystifying this number. This number, this mark is not a divine mark. It is the mark of a human, whatever the human happens to be. Okay, so when Nero sits on the throne, the mark is a, a little check, right, whatever. Um, and then Thaddeus comes on the throne, and now the mark is an X, whatever. Um, and then, you know, whoever comes afterwards changes the mark again. Well, I mean, okay, so you got the check, the X, or the, or the, the you know, the little googly eyes, whatever, all right? Uh, yeah, and I'm kind of making fun of it, I know. But what John is doing here is John saying, look, 
What we need to understand is that this mark is a mark of a human. It is the mark of the devil. It is the workings of the devil created in the mark of a human, and it is imperfect. How do we know it's imperfect? Because of the number, 666. All right, so let's go back to our numerology for a minute. Two things. One, the perfect number is seven. Remember we talked about that? Triune God, four corners of the earth. The number seven is the number of perfection. The number six, it's incomplete. It's imperfect. So seven is the number of perfection. Six is the number of imperfection. Because it's incomplete. There's a portion that's missing. Either one of the triune God is taken out or one of the four corners of the earth is taken out. Either way, you get to six. The number is imperfect. It is human, not divine. So the mark is human and not divine. John uses the numerology to make it clear that this mark is an imperfect mark. This mark will not get you deification. It will not get you into the courts of eternity. So if you get this mark on your body, you may have access to Rome, but you do not have access to heaven. And this mark not only is imperfect, but it is perpetually imperfect. It cannot be perfected. That's why it is 666. You have a number, but when you, when you uh, repeat it, you are, you, it, basically you're moving it out into infinity. It will eternally be imperfect. John is prophesying that the mark of Rome, the mark of a human, will be eternally imperfect. There will never be a human whose mark will be the mark of perfection. Because Christ is the mark of perfection. So literally, did people run around with three sixes on their forehead or on their arm? No. No. They ran around with an imperfect mark. A mark of a human. A mark of imperfection and brokenness. A mark of inability for deification or divine status. Even if it was the mark of the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor was human. Roman emperors died. The mark of perfection is lack of death, which we see in Jesus. The mark of imperfection, which we get from the Roman emperors, is death. So, the number, the name or the number, they're marks of imperfection. Don't be marked with imperfection. If you're going to be marked, this is the thing. This is what John is driving into. If you're going to be marked, be marked with perfection. Be marked by the crucified and risen one, not by Rome. Even if that mark causes you struggle. Even if that mark causes you sacrifice. It is better, far better, to sacrifice for the perfect than not sacrifice for the imperfect. And that's what John is talking about here. Rome, with all of its power, is the living arm of the devil. To be marked by Rome is to not be marked by God. And to be marked by God is not desire to be marked by Rome. The mark of Rome is imperfection. It is a human mark. It is a human number. An incomplete number. And it will never be complete. There will never be a time when the six becomes a seven. You can keep going out. Six, 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 all the way out to eternity. It's like pi, 3.141279, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a philosophy major. But the vision is this, that number will always be imperfect, no matter how far out you go. No matter how many generations out you get, no matter how many decades and millennia of history that number stands, as it keeps going, it will never become perfect. It will always be imperfect. 
the only one who maintains perfection throughout the, the arc of history is God, the ultimate in good. And the devil, the ultimate in evil, is standing against God. So if you're going to hitch your wagon to that ultimate in good, it's got to be with God, which means it's got to be against the devil, which means for John, it's got to be against Rome. And for us, it's got to be against anything that requires our allegiance over God. And I don't care what that is. If there's anything in your life that requires your allegiance over God, then that thing is leading you away from the divine. All right, I hope this helps. I mean, there, there's, you know, this, this particular session has a lot, of, um, a lot of imagery that we continue to hold on to today. The number of the beast... Um, who the beast is, how the beast maintained power, the magic, all that kind of stuff. You know, we, and, and I mean, there's, you know, um, knowing when it's going to thunder and lightning. So being able to answer with thunder, well, look, the best way to answer with thunder is wait for a thunderstorm and then ask the question. Um, again, and they, you know, and people didn't get that, all right? We have this meteorological system. We can tell in advance. I mean, we, we can track where thunderstorms are. People didn't have that. They didn't even know where thunderstorms came from. But if the magician did, if somebody studied it, if you have one person who knows how a thunderstorm works and can predict when a thunderstorm is going to happen, can you imagine what, that, what kind of power that person will create? I know. I can see in the distance that a storm is coming. So that's how they maintain power. That's how they work through all this. All right, my friends, we're going we're gonna to drop it here today. I gave you a lot today. I hope that you have the opportunity to kind of think about it and ruminate it. If you have any questions, again, my information will pop up, uh, will come up after the session. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or thoughts or anything you would like to discuss. I'll try to either include it in the next session uh, or I'll reach out to you directly if you have any questions. I pray that you have a great day, whatever your day brings, wherever you are in the rest of your day, whether it's whether you're you know tuning into this as it's been broadcast or you're catching it later. I pray that you have a great day, whatever it brings, that God blesses you, that you continue to hold on to your faith and your trust and your hope in this really difficult time. Uh, because we have a God who is with us in this really difficult time. God bless you today, and may your day be as blessed as possible. And we'll see you again next week.